witnessing really in many ways the decline and fall of a great civilization because as the, uh, the poet said, <laughs> Nations are only the morality that they have. And when their morality goes, the nations go with it. So it's very important for those of us, whether you're Christian or Jewish or Muslim, that we hold on to those values because the, uh, the, the Quran talks about a group called Ulu Baqiya. Uh, in Surah Hud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, had there not been more Ulu Baqiya, would that there were more people of the remnants. And in the, and in the tafsirs, they say that the Ulu Baqiya are the people that hold on to the virtues of a civilization in its rise when it's in its decline. Those are the Ulu Baqiya. They hold on to the things that made a place great, like integrity, honesty, chastity, loyalty, love of one's country, hubb al-watan min al-iman. To love your country is part of faith. You want good for your country. When it's bad, you want to remind that it's bad. When it's good, you want to encourage its goodness. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restore you jaded, because we're not people that look forward to destruction. We're people that love to see flourishing, human flourishing. One of the most important things in being in a body is taking care of the body. All of us are embodied souls. So we are literally inside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God has created the human being as an embodied creature. So we live inside bodies. And these bodies are trusts. They're sacred trusts that are given to us. And that's why we're told to take care of them. The Prophet wasallam said, Inna haqqa, That your body has a right over you. The right of the body is that you take care of the body. You eat well, you sleep well, and you exercise. One of the most important things in pre-modern cultures was having a martial spirit. And that was partly because there was so much violence in the pre-modern world. Now the violence still exists, but it's usually done through technology. In the past, violence was done with spears and swords. Men met on battlefields, fought wars, territory. We live in a, in a, in a country that even before the Europeans got here, there were many, many tribal conflicts and fights. And the people that lived here had to learn to defend themselves, to protect themselves. And this is part of the Islamic tradition. The martial spirit is very important. When the country is invaded, you need people that have the courage to defend it. It's very interesting that what we're seeing now in some places when the Afghan people were defending their country, from two invasions. In the first invasion, we considered them heroes. But in the second invasion, they suddenly became terrorists. Because defending your country against people is a God-given right. Every human being has the right to defend themselves and to defend their country. Our Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Man ma taduna mahi ma shahida. Man ma taduna damihi ma shahida. Whoever fights and dies defending his property is a martyr. Whoever fights and dies defending his life is a martyr. Whoever fights and dies defending his family is a martyr. That self-defense is a human right. And we live, unfortunately, in a world that is often aggressive and violent. And so the martial spirit is something... This culture now talks about toxic masculinity as if it's an overdose of masculinity. But the reality of it, what they term toxic masculinity is actually deficient masculinity. It's a loss of virtue. It's a loss of chivalry. It's a loss of the true male nature, which is to defend what's right, to honor women, to defend children, 
to defend the hearth and home. These are really important qualities. In our tradition, our Prophet ﷺ was a statesman. He was a prophet. He was a statesman. He was a general. He was a father, a benefactor. He was the greatest philanthropist. He fed over 400,000 homeless people in his life. I did an estimate of how many meals he did based on the average feeding 70 people twice a day. He fed over 400,000 people. That's a sunnah of our prophet taking care of homeless people, taking care of the downtrodden. Our prophet was also a martial artist. And his art was grappling. All of the Quraysh, which is the tribe he came from, were known for grappling and for sprinting and for archery and for horseback riding. In fact, Ibn Abbas said, none of the other Arabs could defeat the Quraysh in grappling. He said, Nobody wrestled with the Quraysh except he defeated them. The Prophet Muhammad met the greatest wrestler of the Quraysh and he was considered the greatest wrestler on the Arabian Peninsula. His name was Rukana ibn Yazid. And the Prophet said to him, do you want to wrestle with me to see who's stronger? Allah or Latin Uzza? And so he said, Sari'ni. The Prophet threw him, Sara'ahu. And then he said, he immediately jumped up and he said, Ud ya Muhammad, do that again. Now people that study martial arts will know that he wanted to learn the technique because he was the, that was the first time he'd ever been thrown. Imam Asyuti wrote a very interesting book called Al Musara'a ila Al Musara'a. Hastening to grappling or haste, haste, hastening to wrestling. And he talks about the importance of learning how to wrestle. And this is something all of the Muslims did in Medina, Mecca and Medina. They learned how to defend themselves. And not just the men, but also the women. And we have great warrior women, Nuseva bint Kaab, Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib, the aunt of the Prophet ﷺ. We have uh, Nuseva also. Khawla bint al-Azwa, great warrior. In fact, she would uh, wear a, a veil, a turban with a veil, and they thought that she was a man fighting. Even Khadi bin Walid initially thought it was a man fighting with them. Sophia, when she saw that the archers, Nuseba, when she saw that the archers had fled the battlefield, immediately went to the Prophet ﷺ. She was taking care of, she was nursing the wounded. She went to the Prophet ﷺ and she said, she began to defend him. She was wounded 13 times in that defense. So people can encourage a kind of effeminate nature, but in the end, this will backfire on any people because the world is always going to have its problems. And so self-defense is a very important quality that we have to inculcate in young people, but also the warrior spirit, like the great Japanese tradition of the Bushido. That was a book that I just gave uh, Khabib, Training the Samurai Mind by Dr. Cleary, who wrote that about the Bushido spirit. It's a translation of a, a Japanese text. And part of the Bushido spirit was to purify the soul, that martial arts is learning how to fight the other, but there's a spiritual martial arts, which is mujahada of the nafs, of fighting the ego. And every true martial artist knows, and it's the ego that gets them. And they said that the Quraysh were never defeated by anybody. The Prophet ﷺ people in wrestling, it said to the point where they gave up drinking zamzam because that was a sacred water for them. In other words, they became arrogant about their prowess. And this happens to people. They become arrogant. When they become too militarily powerful, they become arrogant. One of the great uh, Hainan masters of China, a minister asked him, what destroys a nation? And he said, 
too many successful wars. And the man didn't understand that. And he said, how could too many successful wars destroy a nation? And he said, because the wars will weaken their people and the rulers become haughty and arrogant. And you never have a weakened people with haughty and arrogant rulers except they will perish. Our Prophet ﷺ encouraged, but he never he encouraged training, and and he would uh, tell his people to train, but he never desired to meet an enemy on the battlefield. And in Al Bukhari, he said, "La tatamna adu liqa al adu." Never desire to meet an enemy. Never desire to meet an enemy. But if you have to meet them, then be brave. Then be brave. The Prophet ﷺ, he would, grappling was the way that the Prophet ﷺ would determine if a young person was ready to be part of his army when they were defending their homeland, Medina, which was aggressed upon several times. He would actually have them wrestle and he would watch them and determine if they were ready. So grappling was the, the art that determined their, their ability to be part of the army. His own two son, uh, grandsons, Hassan and Hussein, he had them, uh, he was watching them wrestle. And he said, he a Hassan, he a Hassan, come on Hassan. And Fatima, the, the, the mother, looked at the Prophet and said, do you prefer Hassan? He said, no, but I hear Jibril saying, come on Hussein. The Prophet ﷺ was a great martial spirit but always for the good. And he always wanted the best for all people. He's a mercy according to our tradition. The Quran says in Surah Al-Anbiya, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have only sent you as a mercy to all the worlds. So it's a great blessing to have a warrior spirit like Habib in the Muslim community. Muslims have been thrown to the ground all over the world. We have a lot of places where they've been battered upon by armies that have much superior forces. And unfortunately, there's a lot of suffering. The great Afghan people, a great scholarly people with a great tradition, have been broken and suffering greatly. The Libyan people and other people with a great warrior spirit, Omar Mukhtar, They've also been suffering. The Yemeni people, the great people suffering. The Palestinians, who historically were a very peaceful people. Palestinians have a very peaceful tradition. There's over 3,000 travel logs written in the 19th century about visiting Palestine by Europeans. Not one of them mentions violence or civil strife between the religious communities. Palestinians were never known for that, a kind of belligerence. The Iraqis, another people of great learning. So much of our science, mathematics comes out of Iraq, fallen on hard times. So there's, it's, it's not surprising that people, that they feel uplifted when they see Habib throw down people that trash talk our religion. And, and feel like shouting out Allahu Akbar. I was thinking about trash talking him until I watched him fight Conor McGregor. Then I changed my mind. <laughs> so, my son, because we're Irish, my sons are half Mexican, half Irish. But because we're Irish, one of my sons actually was a Conor McGregor fan until he saw that a Muslim was going to fight him, and then he switched sides. And that's proof that faith trumps clan. And that's one of the powers of our religion, is that we give up nationalism for something greater, which is the spirit. So I wouldn't dare trash talk Habib. I actually just gave him a hug, and I felt like I was hugging a rod of iron. <laughs> So he actually squeezed me to check me out. And so I'm going to go home and start lifting some weights. So next time I see him. So anyway.
Alhamdulillah. It's a great blessing to be here. I really hope that people take these words to heart that we need to really encourage, especially our young people. So many young kids now are just playing these ridiculous games, wasting their life. We see so many overweight young people now. When I was young, you never saw overweight young people. It was very rare. But now there's so many overweight young people, which is very unhealthy. And over time, it gets worse and worse. So it's really important to have your kids train. Uh, I had my boys go to a Korean, uh, up to the black belt, the older ones, because I really believe in that. And uh, when I was younger, a lot of us were very uh, influenced by uh, the great martial artist Bruce Lee. And so a lot of young people from my generation, as it shows you how old I am, from my generation, you know, everybody was suddenly wanting to learn martial arts. And that's what a, a martial spirit does. It really restores that desire, especially in young men, to learn how to defend themselves, but then to, to honor that knowledge and never to abuse that knowledge. Uh, to be truly of the martial spirit, which is, as Jalaladino Rumi said, sometimes we pick up the sword to take the sword out of the hands of madmen. And that's the essence of our tradition. Our prophet was not a belligerent person. He did not like war. He loved peace. And after every prayer that he prayed, the five prayers a day, he said, Allahumma anta salam, wa minka salam, wa ilayka ya'ud salam, fahiyina bis salam. Oh Allah, you are peace, and you love peace, and peace comes from you and goes back to you. May you cause us to live in peace. So it's a great blessing to live in peace, but as a, a wise man said, if you want to live in peace, always be prepared for war. And that's why the Quran says, أَعِدُّ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ أَعِدُّ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ وَرِبَاطَ الْخَيَلِ لِتُرْهِبُوا Unfortunately, that translation in the Quran, you'll often see to terrorize your enemies. It doesn't mean to terrorize. It says, be strong and prepare for war so that you deter your enemies from wanting to destroy you or to fight you. And if you look at the Latin word deter, it's from de terere, out of fear. They don't want to fight you because they're afraid of you. And in a world which is often dog eat dog, it's very important for people to have some fear in their hearts about aggressing on others. So may God put the fear of God in the hearts of the wrongdoers. And the way that he does that is by making the right doers, the salihun, the worthy ones, the righteous, that righteous band of brothers, strong, so that people fear to aggress upon them. There's a lot of criminals out there, and there needs to be people to counter that. And you take your sides in this world. You're either on the side of righteousness, or you're on the other side. There's no neutral ground in this world. So choose your side, but choose well, because there are consequences. We're all on the doors of infinity. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa